daughter, sister, mother, wife, businesswoman, entrepreneur, innovator, leader, inventor, trailblazer. That is what you are, a phenomenal woman. The Mozepe Foundation, through the Center for Gender Equality and Leadership, supports women's participation in the knowledge economy. Since 2017, when the Girls in STEM program was launched with industry partners, 960 girls, 70 teachers from 64 schools have to date attended workshops designed to grow their interest in pursuing STEM careers. Additionally, the Mutsepe Foundation, through the bursary program, has provided university scholarships to students studying STEM subjects. It's not in talking that we achieve the things that we want in life. It is when we get down to business, when we fold our sleeves, when we pull ourselves up and get things done. Women are problem solvers by nature, and as opportunities present themselves in big data, robotics, and artificial intelligence, these tools can be used to innovate and solve socio-economic challenges. We need a radical transformation of curriculum if we really want to talk about for uh, There are environmental factors that need intensive and reinforced women empowerment in the areas of values-based leadership, talent management, the economy, politics, and gender pay gap. Women need to empower and mentor one another and build a network of sisterhood, especially for young women, so it becomes a generational empowerment network. Even though being a woman does come with its challenges, with support and the right opportunities, women are able to overcome these challenges and have agency. One such challenge is the rise of femicide and gender-based violence. Collectively, as men and women, we can put a stop to this. As we begin to change the generational narrative, the support and voices of our male counterparts becomes important in debate and discussion and mapping a way forward. We need more dialogue to enable women to determine their own lives and become the architects of their future. Being a man doesn't automatically translate to superiority. This Women's Month, the Mozepe Foundation aims to empower their participation in the knowledge economy through industry networks that build and invest in their progress. The innovation, technology and future careers for women sessions will bring together South Africa's women in STEM to discuss the current trends. Transforming business and society showcase the diverse roles they play within their sectors, highlight their impact and contributions, and discuss their motivations for nurturing a passion in STEM. You all are beautiful. You are worthy. You deserve the best. Do not for a moment let anyone make you feel otherwise. Go out there, be yourself, succeed. Keep shining because you matter. Sorry, Dr. Mutsepe, kindly please unmute your microphone, please. So, I thought so. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, uh, Nicole, Nicole, thank you very much. And uh, our panel members, um, thank you for joining us. I just want to welcome everyone. Uh, before I hand over to you, Nicole, you, you all saw what today is about. I'm really honored to have amongst us um, the uh, doyens and the um, shining lights in this industry uh, to participate and talk to us about the fourth industrial revolution and what opportunities there are for women uh, in, 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 in this space. This is the end of Women's Month, but I wanna say to you, it's not the end of our celebration. We have to continue celebrating ourselves every day, not every month, every day we need to focus on who we are, our capabilities, improve ourselves. We can be anything that we want to be. And it's important that, um, uh, you know, having people like the executive uh, 
director at Cisco, who also sits on our commission for the fourth industrial revolution in our country, um, Shamane, who's part of our panel to talk to some of our young people. Uh, we have metric people, we've got students at universities that are in the sciences, in engineering, and they want to hear from young people like yourselves, Doreen, Tandega, and Dobigaiise. They want to hear from you what drives you, how did you do the things that you're doing. Um, and of course, we look up to people like Charmaine, who are already in the field, who inspire, uh, uh, inspire us and help us to um, really get into, into this field. So our agenda for our Center for Gender Equality and Leadership at the Mutepe Foundation, we started this because we want to, in, to increase the pipeline of girls that are in the STEM fields. We know that the future post COVID is going to be in the tech world, in artificial intelligence, uh, in the internet of things, you guys are going to be creating robots to um, help us with the health challenges that we have, the education challenges that we have. And it's, 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 it's good that we have women participating in these spaces, because if we don't, the solutions that come out will exclude us. So I'm very excited that you guys are here to share challenge each other, ask questions, and our audience members can also learn from you. So thank you very much for participating, and I'm going to hand over to you, um, Nicole. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Precious Manoy Mutsepe, for that warm welcome and for giving us a detailed overview on why we are actually gathered here this afternoon. Now, just to remind everyone, um, who's tuned in this afternoon, this afternoon's discussion, innovation, technology, and future careers for women. I'd like to welcome all women across South Africa. It is Women's Month. It's important that you get a special welcome. I'd like to welcome our parents who are nurturing young minds out there, our guidance counselors, our teachers, our university students, our Mutsepe Foundation bursary students and alumni, women and youth organizations, and most importantly, our STEM enthusiasts and practitioners out there. Now, this afternoon's panel, the foundation's gone beyond um, excitement and getting us the best in terms of knowledge and experience when it comes to STEM. And, and this afternoon, we are joined by Charmaine Hove, who is the Senior Director of Africa Cisco, Kiara Negern, the South African inventor, scientist, and speaker, Ntombi Kaise Banda, the CEO of Funda Botex Pty Ltd, Doreen Mukwena, digital forensics practitioner and internet governance specialist, Katlejo Malachi, the founder and CEO of Project One Engineering, and lastly, Tandeka Mshanga, the co-founder of Nkatuto Edu Propeller NPO. Now this afternoon, we're going to be discussing problems, thinking of um, creative ways in which we can address those problems through innovation. Um, and, and most importantly, we, we're going to have the opportunity to find out from those who have already um, delved into the space how we can use STEM and, and how we can diversify within STEM to solve challenges um, by coming up with solutions today using technology and innovation. Now, without wasting any further more time, I'd like to introduce our first speaker this afternoon, and that is Ms. Charmaine Hove, who is the Senior Director of Africa Cisco. Now, for those of you who do not know Charmaine, Charmaine holds a master's degree in business administration, as well as a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of South Africa. She has over 24 years telecommunications experience working with the private and public sector across South Africa. Charmaine joined Cisco in March 2016 with several years of experience as a senior executive in diverse transformative roles with leading ICT companies. She is responsible for supporting Cisco with country digitization programs and enabling public sector policy reform across Africa. She also represents Cisco on the Board of South African Communications Forum. Charmaine serves as a chairperson of the South African Women in ICT Forum Board, 
SA Women in ICT works with businesses across the ICT industry and government to drive the development of women in ICT roles. She recently founded AFRIEL, a nonprofit organization that mentors young female leaders. She is also a mentor for the NGO company Girl Code ZA that works with the private and public sector to empower young girls seeking a long-term career in ICT by teaching girls how to code. Ordinarily, I would ask you all to please welcome Charmaine with a warm round of applause, but for this afternoon, we will not be able to do that. So I will encourage you to please express your jubilation, excitement, questions by using the comments box. If you look at the bottom of your screens, you'll see there's an icon called chat, and please use that chat icon just to express whatever it is you're feeling this afternoon, and most importantly, to jot down your questions. Over to you, Charmaine. Thank you very much, Nicole, for the introduction. Much appreciated. Um, to Dr. Precious Motsepe, thank you very, very much for having all of us this afternoon. Um, such platforms are so crucial to all of us who are on the call. I know Doreen quite well. Um, Doreen McQuinn is also one of our doyens in the ICT sector, having recently actually started her own cybersecurity business, which of course I think has become more and more relevant, especially now with all, uh, so many of us being online. Um, staying safe online is one of the key concerns um, for many multinationals and of course also um, for citizens. So it's lovely to see all the other women um, who are on the call. So I think something, Nicole, that's always so important for me, especially for all the youngsters who are actually listening in today, um, is maybe always just to give some context, just in terms of where I come from. So I was raised in a town called Wentworth in Durban, um, in the south side of KwaZulu-Natal, very close to where the old, old, old airport used to be. Um, I was raised actually by my grandmother um, because my mom passed away when I was still very, very young. Um, I was just barely out of nappies. And of course, um, my dad just never shook that feeling of actually having to raise a child. So he was also a very functional alcoholic. So he would get up in the morning, go to work. Um, and my grandmother fortunately actually took me and she actually raised me. Um, and I think that's something that I'm always so grateful for. I'm very grateful because I never felt that I actually missed out um, on a, a loving sort of, of maternal figure which I think defined a lot of who I became later on in life. Of course, back then, um, during the apartheid era, I was actually raised in the barracks. So the barracks was basically just a block, a long block, um, literally, of soldiers' barracks. So soldiers used to live um, in those barracks to go out and fight, um, you know, back then in the 70s and 80s. And then because those long blocks of flats actually had... Um, you know, aluminium roofs and, and they were asbestos. Um, they were just not suitable for human living. So they took the soldiers out and they actually put us families to actually live there because there was no one else to put us when, when the Group Areas Act was enacted. Um, and the fascinating thing is, you know, um, the majority of people who lived in the barracks, the picture is at the top right hand corner, many of them didn't go to school. Um, but the one thing that always fascinated me was that the community was always so intent to ensure that all of us did get a, a very strong education. So, so the one thing that was preached so much by these women in the communities who were always so wise, who were always so tenacious, who um, were always so resourceful, who, who actually literally raised us. So, so I resonate very clearly with the saying that it takes a village to raise a child because I was, I was raised by a village. Um, and, and I think the one thing that they drummed into my head was the only way to escape poverty was through education. So, so I think Fortunately, I think I was a smart enough child and I managed to do relatively well, uh, well at school. Of course, I think a big drawback for me, which um, you know, is one of the reasons why I got so involved in mentorship and counseling and coaching was because of my upbringing and because of having lived in an environment where I always second guessed myself and I didn't have, of course, any role models to really look up to um, you know, in the corporate space where I could reach out to and ask. What should I study? What do I do? Um, how do I behave? Um, because, of course, all we knew was this extreme poverty environment filled with gangsterism, with crime, with excess levels of GBV. Um, that, of course, has to leave a scar on somebody. Um, and I think growing up, um, for any of, of the youngsters, you all are familiar with the movie called Inside Out. And it's a fascinating Pixar movie of this little girl who has to move away from her home environment. And the dominant 
feelings or emotions that come out of this movie are fear, anger, uh, it's, um, you know, around joy and being brave. But I, I did some research on the movie after having chatted to Brene Brown, who is a leading author who speaks about vulnerability and courage. And actually one of the emotions that um, Disney Pixar deliberately left out of the movie was shame. And the reason why they left shame out as an emotion is because shame is a very complicated emotion. Shame is a very deep emotion because at, the, at one point in time, you're ashamed about something, um, but you're not really sure how to handle it. And it's a very big emotion, of course, and it's, a, and it's one that many of us shy away from because we don't really want to, un, un, want to unpack what lies behind someone's shame. And again, I was ashamed of my environment. I was ashamed of my circumstances, but I didn't know why because it's not like any, I did anything wrong or that my family did anything wrong. I just grew up in a very poor environment. I couldn't afford to go to school. Um, I couldn't afford to go to college. I couldn't go to, afford to go to university. I couldn't bring anybody home because we lived in a little one bedroom, you know, barracks. But, and, and, and again, as I grew older and I entered the corporate world, I, I became, that, that shame turned into very extreme anger. The older I got, I became angry and angry at, at my situation, my circumstances. And of course, I took a lot of this anger into the corporate work space. Um, and while I was in the corporate work, workspace, I suffered from these intense emotions around, oh my goodness, you know, I don't really belong here. What if somebody walks in one day and says to me, um, oh my goodness, Charmaine, you don't belong here. You need to go back to the barracks. Why are you in a corporate workspace? And, 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 and again, I think I'm battling those demons um, and battling what the term that I, I didn't know what it was called when I was still young, I only found out about it later on in life that I was suffering from something called imposter syndrome. So imposter syndrome, um, uh, you know, what psychologists actually say is that the people who suffer from it the most are women um, and people of color. We are the people who suffer from this imposter syndrome the most. And imposter syndrome basically means that you always think or you always believe that you were appointed into a senior position, you accelerated into a job, you, you actually were appointed into a board because you were lucky. So it was just the, 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 the luck of the draw that day or people just felt in a good mood so they decided to give it to you. The fact that I'm highly educated, the fact that I paid for all my studies on my own, the fact that I literally work seven day weeks. I don't see my family for months on end. I live on the continent because my job entails working with leaders on the continent, presidents, prime ministers, ministers around driving the digital agenda. But when something comes to me, I always think, oh my goodness, somebody was feeling really good today to give this to me. And I forget all of the sacrifice that I've made, that I never raised my own children, that I haven't seen my husband for months on end. I haven't been in my home. I haven't slept in my own bed. Probably some days, like six, seven months in around refugee camps on the continent, driving um, digital conversations. So, you know, I think very important for me is always trying to get youth to understand that when you work hard, you are going to ensure that you do climb up the corporate ladder. And that is so crucial. Um, and later on in life, when I became a mom, and, you know, I put all of my energy into ensuring that nobody ever went through what I went through, the demons that I battled and the dragons that I slayed had to remain slain. But of course, I think that that was never the case. I think the higher I climbed the corporate ladder, the more I was recognized, the deeper my insecurities and those fears became that I, I should retire. And I kept telling myself every day I woke up, I was retiring. And I think one of the important things why I'm such a huge proponent of mentorship and sponsoring is because... You know, I read somewhere that you can only get out of somebody when you squeeze orange juice out of an orange. You know, when you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice. You're not going to get grape juice or lemon juice. So whatever somebody squeezes out of me has to be what I am. And, and I have to be kind. I have to understand everybody's journey. So I think, you know, the context of us believing that you're going to get work-life balance as you climb up the corporate ladder, as you start to on boards, as you become more popular and successful, Unfortunately, there is no such thing. We just keep working and things just get more and more difficult. You know, something I, I'm so, so passionate about um, driving conversations and supporting and sponsoring men and women, um, because again, I feel that we need each other in these very turbulent and difficult times. But of course, whenever I'm in the home, I have a son and I have a daughter, and um, of course, girls rule in our home. So every time I, 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 I walk around the house singing, who runs the world? My son always says, girls, girls run the world. But of course, you know, it's a dream that we have. And again, you know, visions of things that we put out there, hoping that one day we're actually going to achieve it. 
But you know, it's very sad that um, still we're looking at statistics like 81 years where the United Nations says it will only take, it's going to take us roughly 81 years to get true full inclusivity and diversity and ensuring that women are actually included in the, in the occasion. So not in our lifetime on the corner, in our children's lifetime, probably in their children's children's lifetime, we'll get to true diversity. So these statistics, of course, keep me awake at night. 200 million, there are 200 million fewer women online than there are men. So basically, if you look across the continent, um, you know, when I travel to Ethiopia, I travel to Eritrea, I travel to South Sudan, to Kenya, to Nigeria, there are less women than there are men online, and women also don't have the opportunity to actually give into the inputs. I think, as Dr. Precious was saying, a lot of the products and services and the algorithms that we're actually using out there, very few of that input actually comes from women. 20%, which always fascinates me, this is such an interesting statistics for me, because McKinsey Women Matter Report, which I was part of actually um, collaborating and, and contributing to, that um, Dr. Kunzelem Lamba Milka released in 2016, um, McKinsey was saying that they, they actually did research to show that organizations, countries, entities, enterprises that have women leading them are 20% more profitable than those that don't have women leading them. So then you've got to ask yourself the question, then why are we not more serious about ensuring that countries and organizations, governments, communities are actually led by women? And um, the report also indicated that there are 5% of CEOs in Africa, like 5% um, that are leading true critical roles, CEO roles with this decision making, um, which is an alarming statistic. And what's also very interesting, why those figures actually make sense is because only one in three companies actually has identified that they need to look at full spectrum diversity. So they need to look at pay parity. They need to look at putting together a serious agenda with a transformation case for accelerating women in the workplace. One in three companies look at it and one in three companies, exports and boards are committed to seeing change. They track, their monitor. So again, a very, you know, scary statistic. This one breaks my heart the most because I was a product of this. It was something that I actually did for a long time until I wisened up and I got mentors and coaches and sponsors, 57% of men versus 7% of women negotiate their salaries. So again, you know, because we, I, I, again, you know, I think as women, we, we, we put it down to the luck of the draw of the card. So whereas men are very confident, men will say, oh, well, you know, I've got these following things to look at. We forget as women that some of us, or the majority of us, still wear many hats and we run households, we look after families, we've got extended families in KwaZulu Natal, we have to send to school, we've got extended families that we have to, you know, ensure that we send food parcels for. And yet only 7% of us are comfortable enough saying, actually that salary doesn't make any sense to me when I look at where I'm coming from. Because again, we have imposter syndrome, we like, oh, thank you very much, I'll take it. Um, and we walk away feeling like we've actually been um, defeated, but but we never speak up. So it's a concerning statistic that only 7% of us ask for a better salary. You know, Melinda Gates did a very interesting study, which I'm quite invested in. I'm so, so um, interested in her statistics where I think for a lot of the students who are listening, she says back in the 80s, they were actually qualifying 30% of engineers and engineering degrees, whereas today we're only qualifying 18%. So there is a quite a, a dramatic drop and also very concerning, but again, it's something I can also identify with. Her research and her study globally says that from the age of 13 to 17 years old, there's a very leaky pipeline in schools. So girls, specifically girls, from the age of 13 to 17 in the schools become very they be, they're less interested in technical things and geeky things because we don't want to appear to be smart. We don't want to appear to be intelligent. So we play ourselves down and we actually literally shrink into our little shells because we don't want to show boys up. We don't want to show boys that I, I, I am actually quite smart. I can stand up on my own. I can actually design. I can innovate. I am quite smart. So that pipeline already is quite leaky from the age of 13 to 17. And then we start pursuing careers where we think we may be less of a threat. Um, and so, so we don't want to go into the careers where we're actually quite well-versed. 
And I think, again, you know, I think I'm so grateful for associations like the Mosefa Foundation and many others that bring us these platforms so we can start highlighting these kind of statistics and, and understand that the leaky pipeline doesn't only appear when we get into corporate, we inherit it already from the school going age. Um, and then how do we then get before the corporate years to actually address that pipeline and strengthen it and get us ready for the jobs of the future that the fourth industrial revolution is actually calling for. And then of course, there's always more where women are concerned because we're complicated and we always come with lots of things. In addition to all those concerning stats, I think one of the big things McKinsey picked up, once we leave school, we leave university, we come into the workplace, we're preparing for the world of work, one of the biggest pick issues they picked up globally, it's an issue um, around the double burden syndrome that women experience. So we saw now during the COVID pandemic, especially, that the COVID pandemic brought on so many juggling roles for women, where we are teachers, we are mothers, we are caregivers, we are, you know, corporate executives, we, we speakers, we do everything. Um, and, and, and globally, that's an issue where um, anytime, anywhere performance is demanded of us. And then again, a big issue, especially for us on the continent, is the absence of role models. Because when you come from a community like me, it's very difficult for somebody to guide you. My first job, I literally went through the telecom phone book, a big fat wide phone book, and I called everybody saying, oh, I'd like a job, I need to look after my family. And I was 16 years old, so there was nothing digital. There were no associations, um, you know, like girl code, like geek culture, like I'm the code, like the Motepa Foundation that I could reach out to say, how can you guide me in my next career? An issue specific to South Africa, though, which is very concerning, and it's something I have specifically bumped across in a number of organizations I've worked in, is the unconscious bias towards women in the workforce. Um, we need to start understanding how do we start confronting these limiting attitudes towards women in the workplace. And, and young girls often say to me, you know, Charmaine, there's something there. I can't put my finger on it, but there's just something. When I'm walking to the boardroom, when I'm sitting in front of my boss, when I'm talking to others in a room, there's just something. And, and it's, 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 it's not even as, as openly avert as mansplaining when a man explains, when you explain something, he cuts you in, you know, and, and, and it's not that. It's just something where it's, it's either um, an oversight where you say, oh, my goodness, you know, we've got to prepare for roles of the future and keep everyone safe online. So how about we call Dr. Doreen in to speak about cybersecurity? And... Five minutes later, a man will say, actually, you know what? We need to bring Doreen in. I've contacted her, she's coming tomorrow and everyone will clap hands. And you sit there thinking, oh my goodness, let me just sling it to my corner. I'm not saying anything for the rest of the day. So there, there, there's a very slight bias, but you know, it's not so overt that you can stand up and fight it. Um, it's something where you, it, it causes you to keep down to yourself. So I think that's a big one that we really need to address. And of course, the biases unfortunately creep into technology. So hence why we find ourselves having to, as girls, go and do mammograms that are uncomfortable for us. We do as that we hate. Again, we're not behind any of that technology. So again, how do we ensure that by removing this unconscious bias, it doesn't find its way into technology, that we are the biggest purchasers, or we're the biggest consumers of it, but we're not the biggest innovators. And I think why these statistics then make me want to act, um, I get involved in lots of advocacy bodies. Um, you know, many, many, many years ago, I got involved with Girl Code when nobody knew anything about computer coding, nobody knew about hackathons. We ran their very first hackathon for them in a software company I, I, I'm, I'm a shareholder in called Box Fusion in Pretoria. And there were 20 of us. I still remember packing up the Xbox in my house, driving through, going through a coffees, going through a Red Bull for the girls. And they started this first hack and it turned into something phenomenal. Many years down the line, Zandi and the team are doing phenomenal work going out into rural areas, teaching young girls how to code. And we still, to this day, are running those annual hackathons. Two years ago, we sent the team to San Francisco, to Silicon Valley. They met with some amazing companies in the Valley. Um, you know, last year, the year before last, we sent them to Amsterdam. They spent the full day with the Cisco team in Amsterdam, learning different things. Today, these girls are actually sending Africans to India, to, you know, the UK, to go and work there. Phenomenal story of three young black girls who where somebody just had to trust them and put their faith in them and just call them, talk about them. You know, I think another big issue when with these advocacy bodies is that we all have space in boardrooms, we have space in platforms, and yet we don't invite them in. So all they needed was somebody just to invite them into a CEO meeting, to invite them in to a board meeting, to pitch, to invite them into different spaces where they normally wouldn't be invited. You know, another interesting one for me was the mentorship circle. I started with Cindy Koyana, with Sean Lechetti, the, the, the president of Global Universities for Duke, where we were mentoring men and women 
early in careers, who had just started, who didn't know what to do. And we got them connected to the right people. We had phenomenal people like Wendy Lohabe come and address them, um, Feriel Hafaji, um, Mrs. Mbeki, the president Mbeki, Gloria Sarabe, come and talk to these youngsters to tell them that it is possible. So we formed this mentorship circle just to remind the young early in careers that there is stuff out there that you can actually achieve. Afriel also was birthed from a place where I just felt I've got so much to give. And even though her work is seven day week and Afriel is weekends and holidays and you know, late at night, it's still something that it's a passion project. So it does not, it does not drain me or give me burnout. It's something I'm passionate about. Um, Charmaine, I'm going to just pause you there because I'm also cognizant of time and, yes. and your story is, is really, really inspiring and, and, and I'm glad to see that all your, your projects are passion projects because I think if you're going to do anything, it must come from within and, and not something that you just do because you are told to do, um, which you alluded to in your presentation. And Charmaine, if you could just hone in, 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 in wrapping up the presentation on, on what you think or, or what do you think, um, how can STEM actually influence um, or, or transform our society? Um, and, and what opportunities are available within STEM fields for um, members tuned in today? So I think STEM fields are very wired. I think often um, there's always that panic and there's an uncertainty that the only thing that we can do is go out and get an engineering degree that takes a long time, it's complicated. I know I have to have maths, I have to have science. That's not the case. You know, I think engineering is far and wide. I think most organizations also give you the opportunity to come in and you can also come in and actually study further with an organization. The most important thing is um, that STEM is as wide as, you know, starting from the bottom, you know, core center, like somebody like me did. Um, there's roles in media engagement, there's marketing, um, there's sales. And I think if for any of the women who are extremely technical, where the roles do start getting interesting is Doreen will touch on it a bit later, is when you're wanting to actually design and develop solutions for communities. I think that's when the coding and the designing and the developing starts to come, you know, become quite interesting. So it's, it's, it's a myriad of opportunities, Nicole, that STEM actually does offer. Okay, no, thank you very much for that, Charmaine. Um, and, and just listening to you, you come with a wealth of experience and knowledge. And so my question to you as a woman in a male-dominated industry, um, what were some of the barriers to entry? And how did you overcome those I barriers think, to entry? So I think a big issue for me was just around the lack of having a mentor, having a role model, somebody who looked like me, who sounded like me, who knew my journey. I think that put me back many years in terms of my development because there was nobody I could openly go and ask, how do I do the following thing? You know, and I think if we can all in the spaces that we are actually in, if we could start to extend ourselves, extend our networks, I think that already, and even just platforms like this, I think already starts to address that big gap in the market because I didn't have access to somebody to push me in the right direction or even just to tell me um, what was waiting for me. You know, I also think a big second thing for me was just around access to markets. Um, for so many people who don't want to enter the corporate world or want to go into entrepreneurship, I think there is a big gap in terms of, um, you know, extending ourselves to enough to open doors to a lot of people who are looking for access to markets. It is a big challenge. And I think thirdly, just making ourselves available to, to support different associations who are giving their time um, and who are giving spaces to youngsters who want to um, solve problems in their communities. You know, opening up those opportunities in our organizations and everywhere else, just to hear those ideas and also to give input into those ideas. A lot of ideas I've picked up, Nicole, are stuck at ideation phase. Many mm -hmm. of your people are fortunate enough to move beyond ideation, not from lack of trying, but just because there's just not enough role models, there's not enough mentors, there's not enough sponsors, there's not enough of us to take time out um, just to listen to these ideas and who are willing enough to take the risks of actually spreading those ideas further. And again, I think the last thing is that um, the tech sector or the ICT sector is a best kept secret. Not many people actually get the opportunity to be shown the remarkable things that the tech sector is, can actually do. There's so many of our communities that have so many gaps in them and so many solvable issues. 
But again, you know, I think we misunderstand that the only thing that a phone is there for a phone is to make calls or to send texts or to tweet. But, you know, if you have a phone, you cannot imagine that's literally a lifeblood. This is a thing that you can code on. These are the things you test solutions on. Um, these are things that you set up businesses with. And again, I think the gap is having role models and sponsors just to talk students through the world of possibility that um, the technology field actually holds for youngsters. Thank you very much, Charmaine. I think you, you've given us a, a good overview of um, how important it is that we I have a clear understanding of, I think more importantly, the five-step innovation value process model. And, and it's important that you raise the point that a lot of us are unable to move from idea generation to research, to development, to innovation, and then taking the product to market where we speak of commercialization. And, and it's very important that you actually raise that this afternoon because I think those are the nuts and bolts we need to hone into this afternoon when we say we want to encourage STEM within society. And I'd now like to call upon our very exciting presenter, Ms. Kiara Negren, and she is a South African inventor, scientist, and speaker. Now, Kiara is a South African inventor and scientist. She is known for her award-winning work on the method to increase food security in drought-stricken areas that won the 2016 Google Science Fair. Kiara is currently pursuing her undergraduate studies at Stanford University in the United States. Kiara was 16 years old at the time of her win at the Google Science Fair. She is known as the sole founder of her project titled No More Thirsty Crops in response to one of South Africa's worst droughts in 45 years with the lowest ever rainfall since 1904 and in 2015. Then Kiara developed a unique super absorbent polymer that holds hundreds of times its weight in water when stored in soil. It is also biodegradable, inexpensive, and free of harmful chemicals, unlike the man-made materials currently used. The polymer, made entirely from waste products, improves the environment, increases the chance for plants to sustain growth by 84% during a drought, and it can increase food security by 73% in a disaster-struck area. Kiara has often spoken out on the importance of diversifying the STEM fields to include young girls, which is what brings us here this afternoon. As a speaker at TEDx and Forbes Africa, she's identified herself as an influential speaker. In 2017, September, Kiara was a speaker at LEAD SA Changemakers Conference. And in 2018, Kiara was nominated as a regional finalist of the 2018 United Nations Young Champions of the Earth. Kiara, I look forward now, and I'm sure the rest of our audience looks forward to the presentation on the ongoing drought and the No More Thirsty Crops project. Over to you, Kiara. Thank you so much, Nicole, for the amazing introduction. Sorry that I'm slightly late, but thank you so much to everybody else. It was so amazing listening to Ms. Hovitt uh, earlier about the amazing work um, she's doing in STEM. I I think one of the reasons that I'd like to join calls like this is because when you listen to people that are older and that are trying to get young people involved in STEM, I always like to say that your actions and, and the passion that you're putting in the projects are not getting lost in young people. They are being translated, that we are picking up on them. We are seeing the, um, the need for it and we are kind of picking up the baton and moving along. And, and, and really pushing South African innovation. Um, kind of in a bit, uh, in terms of background for myself, I'm 20 years old now, um, born, brought up in Johannesburg, South Africa. I, um, in, when I was in high school, I started looking at um, issues the South African community was experiencing. And one of the main things was the drought um, that was one of the worst droughts South Africa ever experienced in 30 to 40 years. And the amount of innovation we were doing, but not just us, but globally around the space in drought and green technology was extremely low. And I decided to, I didn't really get help from school or um, have access to labs to kind of experiment. So what I decided to do was um, actually take what access I had in terms of the internet. And I think the internet is pretty much the most you need to do most innovation nowadays. 
and I started looking at what solutions there were in the drought space and what I could do to push the boundary and what I ended up coming up with um, through experimentation in kind of the kitchen and garage was creating a polymer that helps plants combat drought um, by essentially acting as a reservoir. So when plants do experience rainfall or have water, this essentially uh, is biodegradable and low cost um, that you can apply to the soil of a plant to uh, retain water over large periods of time. And that was kind of something that I didn't really know where the, where the future was gonna go in that project, but I knew that it was something that I was interested in. And I knew that anybody that has access to a tool like the internet um, can kind of use to push innovation, especially in the field that I was working in. And when something uh, came along like the Google Science Fair, which is an annual competition um, that young people ages 13 to uh, 19 can enter, I decided that well, that was a great way to get the project out. And I was privileged enough to go over to Google um, in Mountain View, present the project to the CEO and have it actually win the science fair and, and the community impact award. And um, that, that kind of allowed me to, at, at a young age when I did come up with it, which was around 17, 18, it, it allowed me to kind of circumvent the entire go to market because I was able to be connected with companies that could assist with research and development. Um, but definitely going into that process was extremely difficult and trying to navigate it as a young person that kind of has an idea and did research into that entire project myself. And after kind of doing that, I realized the need of getting young girls involved in STEM, but not, ne not necessarily just STEM because we don't really want a lot of young girls just getting STEM degrees and then just working in companies. I think it's the young girls that need to be pioneers in those fields that need to not only believe that they can be part of that industry, but they can lead that industry. And I think that mindset is super important and has been extremely important to me. And kind of as an undergraduate going into kind of Silicon Valley's heart and seeing all the other people that are supposed to be kind of the best um, technology minded young people. I think one of the biggest things that I picked up being at a place like Stanford is that there's absolutely no difference to any young South African that can solve a problem. Like it is, it's pretty, it's exactly the same that if you take a problem, you solve it. That's pretty much what everybody else has been doing across the world. When you come up with Facebook, when you come up with Instagram, those people essentially weren't given those ideas. They came up with them and they figured out how to do them themselves. And, and when you think that you don't have, you, you're not in that same space as those people that are over there in America or different parts of the world, I think that's, that's not true. So young South Africans that come up with any idea is just as good compared to any other young person across the world. And, and that what that means is that if you give South African, young South African females, especially the tools and how to approach those problems, you know that they're gonna come up with something that can be the next um, biggest company. And right now as a software engineer, software engineering intern at Facebook, you kind of see that, that the things you're being taught and the things you're doing is not different in any way to the tools and skills that young South African girls can have. So it, 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 we need to change the mindset that we, we are kind of here and we need to have the resources to um, improve, um, to get to that level. We're already on that level. All the ideas we come up with is just as good. Um, and the only thing that's different is how uh, young people can approach the situation, the confidence they have, and the people that they can look up to. And yeah, so it's the, the people that they have in their spaces, young females that are kind of doing things in that same industry is super important because we see in South Africa that it's really difficult to get started as a young person and see people in that field that you can look up to. And so for, for me, particularly being um, able to look at look at role models, especially in the South African field, um, especially people on this call has been really something pivotal in kind of my journey going towards innovation and, and creation of um, STEM products to help, help um, communities. 
Thank you very much, Kiara, and thank you for giving us a, a comprehensive overview on how STEM can definitely transform communities. Now, Kiara, um, I, I know you're doing your undergraduate right now, but there are lots of young um, people in the audience today. And, and just a simple question, Kiara, to you. How do you actually deal with criticism? Yeah, so I think a lot of the times when you're trying to kind of deal innovate and create things a lot of the times it is very difficult to to kind of break into that space especially now that I see um kind of as I started my own company in um based in South Africa in that is technology orientated I think a lot of the times when you kind of approach people for funding and and kind of pitch an idea the fact that you're still young it is definitely a boundary in South Africa specifically if you go to Silicon Valley, when you're 20 years old or 21 years old, it's it's something to be proud of that you've come up with this idea as a young person. In South Africa, there's kind of this pushback that you don't really know what you're talking about, which has been difficult to navigate, especially getting that criticism. I think the best thing that you can do is always let your work um, speak for itself. At the end of the day, if you created a technological algorithm that is able to kind of optimize something, and that optimization is better than what that company that whatever company it is based in South Africa is doing. The product speaks for itself. What you're doing speaks for itself. So I think a lot of the times when you do get criticism, it's not um, great as you kind of approach that, approach that situation, but having your work and what you're able to do and come up with, um, have those results kind of explain what you're doing and, and, and how it can kind of add a value is something that I found is the easiest way to kind of not shut down any criticism because I think uh, people and like older people in South Africa still um, have have a role to play in mentorship and, and assisting us in kind of getting things out because we wouldn't be able to do it without the generations above us. But I think having whatever we're coming up with uh, lead the way is, is definitely a way that I've been able to handle criticism. That's awesome. Thank you very much, Kiara. And, and uh, what you've done with your particular um, idea in terms of, of the, five, the five steps, you, you, you've definitely displayed how through using the five steps and actually focusing on the, the research, the development, um, you were able to not only just come up with an idea but, but actually solve a problem because, because that's the purpose of STEM, because we're trying to drive um, change, but we're also trying to create solutions in society. Thank you very much for that, Kiara. And then I'm just gonna ask you one more thing. How can we accelerate the next generation of technology entrepreneurs and innovators in South Africa? I think that's a great question actually and something that I've been thinking a lot about, which is, a lot of the times we think that the way we can get into STEM or encourage people to get into STEM, which I've definitely focused a lot on, um, is kind of at a school age, getting young girls knowing that they can kind of pursue degrees um, in STEM. And I think now that I'm taking a different look in it, I, I, I think that there is other ways we can also kind of push that boundary, um, which is as young people that have ideas, how can we actually get them the funding they need and the connections they need to to actually create that company or or that organization or have that project reach market have patents on that project um as as a young person that is trying to create something kind of having the the rights you need to kind of first of all get the legal uh legal rights to something that you're creating getting the um, compensation you have for, for a project is, is extremely difficult in itself. And the way young girls, especially approach innovation should be that they have the right framework to approach things in terms of accelerating their growth. So um, kind of across America, you see these kind of VCs step in, these large VCs that can come in, take young people's ideas and grow it. In South Africa, we need to have young people know that the ideas that they're creating is resonating, that when they have uh, results, when they have an impact, that people can support them, they can give them the network, they can give them the funding they need. So it's not going to take five years to get um, an app to market. It's going to take 
uh, a couple months once you've improved, you've beta tested and, and you've um, kind of improved the technology behind it, that you can achieve those results and having them kind of supported in that in that way of having their projects reach market because not everybody can kind of enter a science fair and, and get their project out there because there's just not that many science fairs right now and having them be able to get that support at, at an early stage is something that is it is one of the most impactful ways you can actually get innovations to market and having that impact. Thank you very much, Kiara. And I think opportunities like we have this afternoon in itself is an opportunity for you, as Kiara has alluded to, because the Mutsepe Foundation has created a platform and a space, and, and it's definitely one that you need to leverage from as the audience. Thank you very much, Kiara. To Kiara and to Charmaine, um, the audience are posting questions in the chat box to the right of our screens. Um, please have a look at those because at the end of the presentations, uh, there will be an opportunity for you to respond to some of the questions posed by the audience this afternoon. And I'd like to now just say thank you very much to Facebook for promoting the Girls in STEM webinar. We are live on Facebook and thank you very much for that. Our next presentation um, will be by Katlejo Malachi, who is the founder and CEO of Project One Engineering. Katlejo will be delivering a presentation on the automation of supply chains and the impact this would have on employment and production through the showcasing of Project One Analytics. Katlejo is an engineer as well as founder and CEO of Project One Engineering. Using an international experience, in manufacturing and supply chain engineering, she has carved a path in STEM field and invented an innovative software called Project One Analytics. Project One Analytics uses traditional engineering principles covered with the exciting world of artificial intelligence to change the way manufacturers do things. The solution automates and interconnects a manufacturing facilities process and components. This tool saves manufacturers money through transparent analytics and brings next-gen intelligence to problem solving. Katlejo, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm just going to stop my video for a second so I can share my screen and then I'll talk you through that tool. Okay. So, Basically, this, this tool is a software tool where I've used artificial intelligence as well as IoT scanners to um, put together a, a data pool from all of the components in manufacturing. So, all right. So it's called Project One Analytics and it's basically taking manufacturing processes which are right now very manual you're driving your forklift you're moving your box from one area to another manually now i'm looking at a future where manufacturing is self-driving okay so everything that we use today from our shampoo to our shoes, uses or was rather produced in a manufacturing facility. Now, manufacturing facilities have thousands of different components. They have your conveyor belts, your, your machinery, your robotics, all of these different components that are continuously creating data. This data usually goes into a data pool that the manufacturer will go into maybe once a week, maybe even daily. And then they will come up with a report that says, today we actually produced this much of a, a product. Were we on target? Were we not? How was our quality compared to our quality target? How was our um, use of resources? And it will usually be manual reports. So you have what's going on inside of the manufacturing facility is products are, are moving constantly from raw material up to what will come out of the plant as your product. So from our shampoos to our cars, it starts off as parts or, or different chemicals, and then it comes out as 
um, whatever it is that we want to purchase. And same with our logistics and our supply chain processes. Some parts are coming from different parts of the world. They'll come to South Africa. Whatever we're producing has to come from the manufacturing facility to our door. What Project One Analytics does then is that it takes all of these different um, data sources and says, instead of us manually having to sit down and plan out, okay, this is going to come from China is the best source for a certain material to come, or Mpumalanga is the best place for raw material to come from into Johannesburg, and um, what's the best method to turn the raw material into a product, and how do we get it to a customer? This is a long chain that is usually um, someone has to sit down, resource planners, engineers like I am, we have to sit down and figure out what the best route is. This tool uses artificial intelligence to compare all those different combinations and the different options that we can use. And it selects the best fit option. So I've been an engineer for eight years. I could never, even if I sat down for hours, I could never um, consider every single option to find the best option to move one product from point A to point B. I can't, I can um, research and do all of these things, but we are constantly trying to find the best way that will use the least resources and will save us money. So every day we're constantly finding a better way. A computerized system can do this within minutes. So what will it look like? So you see there in my slide, I have a, a robotic arm moving an engine from one section to another. This data analytical tool will be able to look at the engine and say, oh, actually, there's a weak spot on this, and there's a better way that the robotic arm can hold the engine for it to be optimized. And all of this will be available on a screen that manufacturing can just go into, click on, this is actually the best option to, to put the engine into the car, and then it will show what savings there will be. And that is Project One Analytics. Thank you very much for that amazing um, presentation. I think we, yeah, I've, I've definitely been blown away. <laughs> <laughs> Katleho, um, just a quick one. I, I know you developed this particular project and I'd just like to ask you as a young innovator, um, Earlier on in your career, um, were you able to leverage off partnerships and, and what collaborations have you had if you were able to leverage off partnerships? And how have you been able to grow your network and, and leverage from them if you were able to do so? Okay, so I've moved from um, several, I, I went to WITS first, WITS University, and I met a lot of my engineering friends there. Then I moved to TUT and I met a very different set of engineers there. So there's, there's engineers that really focus in on the theory and there are engineers who always want to get to the practicality of how do we, let's do it now, let's, let's solve it now. And from those two groups of um, friends, I was able to kind of find a medium and I know who, who I can contact about what. If it's a project where we need to get things done, get things done quickly, I've kept those relationships going throughout the years. So I, I left South Africa at some point, but still keeping my South African network going enough that if I have a problem somewhere, I can say, you know what, I would solve this engineering problem like this. What do you think? Or what do you think? How could you potentially solve this? And you get different perspectives from different people. Okay, great. So I, I so also I know you're a Vitsi. I'm in there. Now that I know you're a Vitsi, <laughs> um, what type of intellectual property rights have you applied for? Because I'm sure your peers advised you on how best to make sure that Project One so, Analytics succeeds. Katleho, can you hear us this afternoon? 
Okay, I have been alerted that Catlejo does have um, some. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Antiswa, um, are you able to hear Katleho? Or Doreen, are you able to hear Katleho? No. Okay. So I have been alerted to Katleho's technical challenges, but um, the team is working behind the scenes to resolve that. Um, and I'm just going to check here in the comments box if there are any Hello? Are you with us? Hi, Nicole. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, we can Sorry, hear you. Welcome. Awesome. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Please proceed. Okay, I was saying that I did apply for a patent that's still in process of being approved. Okay, okay. So, Katlejo, what we got there is Katlejo understands the importance mm -hmm. of one. Um, we can hear you slightly, but there's still, still a break in terms of network, Katlejo. But I think I got the gist of what you're saying is that one, you have applied um, for the relevant rights, for property rights, to make sure that your product is patented um, because it's very important as young people and people in STEM that we understand that when we innovate, and, and we eventually take our product, or even before we actually take it to commercialization, we do the necessary legal work to make sure that what we develop, what we create is always protected. And, and I note that we've left Katlejo, but I will make mention of a comment that was left in the comments box for Katlejo that says, wow, Katlejo, this is phenomenal work, super inspiring to see real life for IR case studies at play. Again, what we keep um, reminding government is that what makes FOIR unique is a result of the confluence of multiple technologies, which have previously existed in isolation. Applied correctly, these technologies do have the ability to improve social and economic conditions. Definitely so. I think as young people using STEM, we can definitely um, find solutions for tomorrow's challenges today if we apply STEM correctly. And, and that's what makes this afternoon's engaging, engagement so exciting. Now, our next presenter, Ntombi Kayise Banda, is the CEO of Funda Botics Pty Ltd. And Ntombi Kayise will be presenting uh, this afternoon the importance of language in STEM education and the invention of the Funda Botics platform. Now, for those of you who do not know Ntombi Kayisi, she has over 15 years experience in youth development and STEM education. She, of course, has a passion for education and technology. Ntombi founded SciExplo, a nonprofit organization, and Funda Botics is a recipient of multiple awards, including the SAB Foundation Social Innovation Awards, Shall Accelerate um, Her Pitching Competition Award, UK Newton Fund, Leaders in Innovation Fellowship Award. Funda Botics was a finalist in the 2019 SA Innovation Summit Inventors Garage Competition. Now, Ntombi Kaisi, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Um, let me just quickly share the screen while I introduce myself. Okay, so uh, my name is Ndombege Sebanda and I'm from Funda Botics. So we're all about nurturing young innovators. And I'm so very happy to have seen quite a few innovators in our panelists because that is what we actually want to, I mean, that's the mission of Funda Botics. We don't want to only be consumers of technology from outside, but we want to use the skills that we learn from schools and that we, um, yeah, to, to, uh, to use STEM skills to empower ourselves to solve local challenges um, and even global challenges. So we want to be players in the global market as South Africans. Um, so Funabotics is has great support from Tax Novation, which is uh, University of Pretoria's high tech business incubator. And it, it's also sponsored, um, it receives some sponsorship from the Motsipe Foundation. So we are a beneficiary of that and we really, really want to thank the Motsipe Foundation for that. So I'll just quickly describe what led me to Fundabotics. Um, 
So when I started computer engineering, I was one of the few lucky students that had programmed in high school. And basically quite a lot of the students that I attended school, attended university with, particularly because as I was studying computer engineering, they had not coded before, or even some of them had not even touched a computer. So by the end of the first year, we lost quite a lot of number of students. And in fact, it is said that as few as 10% of engineering students graduate in rocket time. So that means we lose quite a lot of number of students. And then from those that are left over, they take quite a, a, a long time to actually finish the studies. And I believe that this is because of lack of proper foundation in math and science. And that's because math and science is really taught in an abstract manner. You know, you see things and you can't really relate to the subject content. And that's what Fundabotics wants to address. We want to make math and science relatable. We want to make it tangible and engaging. So we believe robotics is a wonderful tool for that. The reason for that is that it actually is a multidisciplinary um, subject. It encompasses quite a lot of components or subjects from other areas. So you have maths, physics, electronics, computer science, even psychology, because when you design robots that interact with people, you need to consider things about how do they interact with the people? How, uh, how, how do they relate to people? So the psychology in how they address uh, human beings and the natural conversations that they will have, that needs to be factored in. And so robotics is an amazing tool to actually combine all these different fields into one. And so from, uh, so from going through a robotics education program, you're actually quite, you get an understanding um, an enhanced understanding of different subject matters. So this is where our journey began, where we had where we had holiday clubs and we're teaching robotics um, to students in the Tswani area. So I have to mention that I'm from Harangua, and we went to townships like Mamilodi, Harangua, Etridgeville, and we, we started from basics where we were building our robots using cardboard. Um, and at that time, we were also importing some of the electronic components from the UK. Um, and, but at the end of this, the students would want to own their own robots. And because the components were pretty, pretty expensive. So that's what drove Fundabotics to, uh, to, to and what, what gave birth to basically to Fundabotics. So the idea behind Fundabotics is we want to develop a platform that can be affordable to everyone. So we want to close the digital, the digital gap and the learning gap and make this accessible to everyone, whether in the township or rural areas. And the driving force behind that, that meant that we had to innovate quite a lot in terms of how to take this robotics kit down. So I'm not too sure if you can see this. Um, so this is our microcontroller board. And to be able to code the robot, you have to code it into this chip. And to make this affordable, that meant that we had to use some bit compression and a number of technological innovations to be able to fit a large amount of code into the small bit, into the small chip. And the reason being because we are, we are driven by cost. So this is a, 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 a cost-effective chip, but it has limitations. And so we had to bridge those limitations uh, through our innovation cycle. Um, so just to give an overview of what we work, so we've got an e-learning platform um, and then our the Funda bot, which I've got over here. And you basically assemble the robot um, and then while going through some module learning material on our e-learning platform, and then you can code this robot using a cell phone or a, a, a computer in your African language. So this is the great, I'd say another innovation that we need because in the spirit of making things relatable, sometimes language becomes a barrier in understanding certain concepts. So when you can understand a concept in your home language, it makes it much easier for you to even go further and enhance your, and it, it further enhances your understanding. So this was an important factor in our education platform to make sure that we support all African languages. And another thing is that in our content, we make sure that we integrate indigenous knowledge. So make content relatable 
so that it's not something abstract. We're not talking about ships when you've never been on a ship, you know? So it needs to be something that you relate to, you see every single day, and then you can start innovating around it. So once a person has coded, they can upload their code onto the brain, we call this the brain, and then that code will be, um, then the microcontroller will then action whatever user code has been written. So this is just a quick slide of our um, interface for, the, for coding the robot. As you can see here, we've got blocks. And the, so the initial stage is that you learn how to code in block. So this, this is called the blockly visual language. And then later on, you can do text-based programming. And I need to also emphasize that we're not just teaching coding. We are teaching coding with an understanding of it will be applied to solve a problem somewhere. And it will also teach coding in such a way that we integrate math and science concepts. So through these type of sensors, for example, kids can learn or learners can learn about wave properties. Uh, you learn about um, reflection and even the distance speed time formula. So I don't have time to give a demonstration of how that factors into this thing. But there are a lot of science concepts that can be integrated and you can actually test it with your code and get an understanding of, oh, so this is what we mean by reflection and how it affects the entire robot. So just, just to show. So I've got a video, but I won't go into it because I realized that we, okay, let me just skip over it. But I realized that we are running out of time, but it's just, just a short video. Perhaps let me show just some small part, um, which is, sorry, just to show some small part to show how the robot, some of the, movement of the robot and I'll quickly talk through the videos because it's a short video uh, but this is demonstrated that our robot can be coded on mobile phones on the PCs um, and we've run quite a number of tests with kids from the local areas here they're learning electronics um, and one of the robots that has been designed was a light following robot where you shine um, a light source and the robot follows that light so there's quite a number of different from, uh, from this kind of effort. So it's just a quick demonstration of um, our funda bot in action. So um, just a quick give background on who I am. I didn't uh, mention that. So I studied computer engineering at the University of Pretoria, and I did a master's in computer science at the University of Cambridge in the UK. And I'm currently in the final stages of my PhD in computer science. So I'm focusing on artificial intelligence. And the great thing is I'm actually focusing on the reading of focusing on making computers read human emotions. So when we design our robots, we want our robots to be able to see what state we're in, whether we are happy or sad, and then it will then adjust its strategy or the way it interacts with us based on what it, on, based on our facial expression or the emotion that it has detected. So that's my PhD research. Um, and then this is the team behind Fundabotics. And in terms of, I think uh, Nicole just has mentioned quite a few of the awards that we've won. Um, the, the, the most maybe significant one is the SAB Foundation um, because it comes with a grant to help us produce our product and to take it further. So that's in a nutshell, Fundabotics. And to just also tie up the, the importance of language in STEM education, as I've mentioned, that we need to understand what we're learning and using home languages, makes it possible. It reduces those, it removes those barriers and makes the material more accessible. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Ntombi. That was a really, really exciting presentation. I particularly have a keen interest in robotics and I do think um, there are a lot of good work we can do by using robotics more in education. Um, I, I must say, I once had the opportunity of visiting an institution abroad and one of the co-curricular activities um, for, for, for learners after school, as well as for university students in their free time, was to go into a lab and explore how to create different robots and how those work. And, and, and it's really exciting because as you displayed, in, you, you can do robotics, but the, it's not one degree. It's not one yes. degree. Mm. So even if you're from the humanities or, or you're from a, a BSc background, you can still contribute to, to STEM in solving solutions. And that's, that's really exciting. Because I, I heard this phrase quite recently called the lost Einsteins. 
And that is how there's so many Einsteins in a classroom. But because of maths, sometimes we miss out on an Einstein. And so we need to dispel the myth of the lost Einsteins. And so I'm going to ask a question. How do we shift then from, from quantity to a more quality approach in teaching STEM within higher ed as well as in schools and creating a culture around robotics um, in solving um, problems in society? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. So the key thing in, create, in, in having quality education is making sure that there's an understanding of the material. And that means engaging, finding a way of making the material come to life. So for example, robotics is just one of the tools. There's quite a number of things that um, can be used. We've got now in uh, technology such as augmented reality and virtual reality. And these should be assisting us to make sure that we can bring the subject matter to life. So math shouldn't be about angles and we, we the question is how do, how does, how do those angles make sense or how do they affect me in my normal living life? And if we bring that connection and we start having exercises in classes where it's not just learning the concepts, but we are putting those concepts into practice through some tangible uh, gadgets or, as I mentioned, uh, to, uh, sort of augmented reality, then it increases students' understanding. They, it moves away from being abstract. It, it becomes engaging, interactive, and they get to master the concepts much more. So we need to move away from blackboard teaching to let's use all these technological tools that are available in, in society and let's get kids practicing maths um, in a tangible manner. And it doesn't have to be high cost. As I mentioned, when we started off, we used uh, cardboards, even for our robots, we would use milk cartons. And those are easy, or those are initial steps that one can take towards bringing maths and science to life. Thank you very much for that. And it's just, it's about the application. And, and Charmaine yes. mentioned to this at the beginning of, of our webinar this afternoon. It's about how you apply um, your knowledge versus just regurgitation, which is so important. And, and mm. that's where sometimes STEM becomes abstract to us because we so sit in rudimentary education, we're not seeing the broader opportunities that STEM has for us because we're all born with an idea but it's how do we then further develop that idea without feeling intimidated by the barriers to entry that our previous speakers have alluded to. And, and so my second question then to you and Tommy Casey is, what lessons can you share with our audience when you're looking at, when you develop this robot um, in terms of the product differentiation? What were the lessons you learned there? Because this is not the first robot. <laughs> um, how, how did you realize that you would need to be better um, in, in terms of differentiating your project. Um, and then also link to that, the, the profitability, because we've got parents um, in the audience today, and as much as they want to nurture young talent, they also want the young talent to be profitable. <laughs> so, so if you could just share a bit of that with us this afternoon. Thank yes. you. Um, so great question about the differentiators, because yes, uh, there are quite a lot of robots available. Um, but when you look at the market for robots, quite a lot of them actually high-end robots. And that's the gap that we are addressing of how do we get robotics in townships and rural areas and make, I mean, in an affordable way, right? So that meant having to go through an exercise of reducing the cost intentionally through innovating, so through our technolo technological innovations. So that is actually a strong product differentiator because that is a very difficult task. As I mentioned, we had to even go down to bit compression and other types of um, um, things that we had to do with the microchip. And then in the design of the robot itself as well, um, that cycle of how do we reduce the cost of producing um, the body of the robot because that is actually also adds up quite a lot to the cost of the robot itself. And then the other thing is the integration then of African languages on our platform, um, you know, making sure that we integrate indigenous knowledge in our educational platform, that is also a strong product differentiator um, at this stage for the company. And as we go on, we'll always be looking to make sure that we are aware of the competition and how do we, bet, how do we continuously innovate to make sure that we stay ahead or, or yeah. 
be a strong competitor in a way. But I forgot your second and question. It um, was around profitability. profitability. Oh, yes. yes. Um, so it is a bit of a, a balancing act, particularly now that our low cost manufacturing, I mean, sort of our low cost robot uh, may mean that they, we may not get as high profit as we may want to. But the way that we went going about it is we then will, we are planning to produce a range of robotics kits. Then the high end one will have more sensors, more functionality, and then we'll be able to price that much more than this low cost. Because right now this is driven by a social mission of let's get robotics into townships. Then the other high end will then cater for those who want all the bells and whistles. Okay. Thank you very much. And before I let you go, <laughs> or let you have a break, um, I have to say our, our audience this afternoon is just wowed by your presentation. And uh, one of the questions I got here was, oh, there's so many, they keep coming in. Um, okay, the first is a comment. Thank you for your amazing project. Um, I reside in Westbury, Johannesburg. Please consider coding training in our disadvantaged area. And then the other is also a comment. I'm so inspired by robotics, especially being introduced to townships. And then there was a question around, I still see men sideline women in technology. I am a woman in technology and get very little support from my male counterparts mandatory policies to break this digital silence of women in technology. What are your views on that, Ntombi Casey? Thank you. So, um, within the company, maybe let me talk from a uh, support base. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy about the movements that are currently occurring, I mean, that are currently happening with regards to empowering women in STEM. And I think with time or with even effort within our companies to start challenging some of, um, what do you call this? To, to, to start challenging the, the views of, I mean, especially if, if you're in a male dominated area, because that's typically what happened in a lot of companies that I worked in is you end up being the only female. And unfortunately the owners in those cases will be on you to challenge the status quo. But then being plugged into a supportive network of women helps you and equips you with skills of how we can tackle some of these challenges in the workplace. And it may take some time because even the woman emancipation took some time, but slowly will change the mindsets of our male counterparts. And I'm very glad that we have even men who are supportive and are rooting for us. So it's just a matter of in your space, try working and challenging status quo and get plugged in into a supportive network of women who may also assist you in getting there. Thank you very much. And I think the message that, that's been driven home here is, is plug into a network. And I think this afternoon, the Mitsepe Foundation's created a platform for us to develop a network. I mean, Shemaine alluded to the fact that mentorship is so important. And, and Katlejo spoke about her experience at Vits and how she used that as a network. And, and once again, it's been reinforced by Ntombi Casey about how your network, your group, um, your immediate circle ultimately becomes your net wealth. So thank you very much for that. I'd now like to introduce our next presenter, and that is Ms. Doreen Mukwena, Digital Forensics Practitioner and Internet Governance Specialist. Doreen, your bio is lengthy. Um, I do apologize for shortening it. <laughs> um, and Doreen is a digital forensics practitioner by trade. Doreen is the internet governance specialist for the South African Domain Name Authority, a state-owned entity that manages licenses and regulates the .za namespace in South Africa, inclusive of the country code top-level domain name and the generic top-level domain name. This is very important for all of you in the audience. <laughs> Doreen is a member of the National Cybersecurity Task Team, Women Think Code Ambassador winning of the Inspiring 50 Women in Tech. Um, she's also a member of the Institute of Commercial Forensic Practitioners and the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. Doreen holds numerous qualifications in policing, forensic law policy, and digital forensics. She's currently completing a BCom degree in information technology management. 
Doreen, we look forward to your presentation on cybersecurity in which you will be discussing the digital divide. Over to you, Doreen. Oh, thank you. Right. Um, first of all, I would like to kick it off by saying thank you so much for the, uh, for the opportunity to be here and um, to all the ladies. I mean, it's Women's Month and it's so inspiring to see a whole lot of women and young girls who are uh, bridging the digital divide. And so basically today, um, well, I'm just going to speak about um, digital forensics and cybersecurity from the top of my head because the presentation that I had prepared was for an innovation or invention rather that I had um, done, you know, post or pre-COVID-19. Uh, COVID so in terms of um, cybersecurity, I would really, really like you to lead and I will then um, answer your questions and we will talk about anything from uh, digital forensics to cybersecurity to internet governance and to policy and regulations. So to basically kick it off, I, as a software developer and as a digital forensics practitioner, I have something that I had prepared. It's called Employee Connect. Employee Connect came through when I realized that we have a problem when it comes to policy adoption and policy implementation in South Africa from a government perspective to uh, civil society, academia, and the research community. So what I did, I'm just going to share my screen shortly. Okay. Okay, just a second. Okay, seems like I'm gonna be having a bit of technical glitches. Okay. okay, whilst we're waiting for Doreen to share her screen, <laughs> Um, I am going to remind all of you who are tuned in this afternoon to please use the, the chat box on the right um, to pose any questions that you may have this afternoon. And then to all our panelists um, present this afternoon, uh, Kiara, Shamain, Katlecho, and Tumbi Akisi, uh, Tandeka, as well as to you, Doreen, just a question to think about for, for the end of our, our discussion is, what is the value proposition of your innovations when compared to innovations from, let's say, the global north? Um, and, and how can you challenge the myth that, that African um, women inventors are, are lower than, than those in the global north? Just something to think about. Doreen, I see your presentation's back. Over to you. All right. So, um so just to give everyone who's here and thank you so much guys for taking your time i mean you could have been anywhere but today you chose to be here with us and alongside all these amazing innovative women in tech and welcome to you ladies so just a brief background about myself is um i'm doreen mcguena i work for the um for zetna Zetna is a state-owned entity that manages and regulates the .za namespace in South Africa. So I am your internet governance specialist. My responsibility is to take care of internet in South Africa. So I take care of digital inclusion. I take care of access. I take care of your cybersecurity, policy regulations, and of course, the .za namespace. So the .za namespace is the little um, name at the end of your website. Your .co.za is actually managed and regulated by uh, Zetna, which I actually designated on. So what I have done here is um, we have developed a little uh, tool. It's called Employee Connect. So what Employee Connect does is it, um, it, mod it modernizes the way we see policy developments 
in South Africa. So this app and software, I did it for startups, I did it for schools, for anybody who wants to modernize their policy adoption in their own environment. So what I, I'm just gonna play guys a little clip that explains what this um, solution is all about. Okay. So um, poly, uh, this uh, Employee Connect is actually available on board uh, on both Android and um, Apple iStore. It can be downloaded. So we're gonna be going live, uh, live very soon. So right now this is still on the development space, which is actually the last one. So in a few weeks, you guys are gonna be able to download this and actually upload your policies for people to actually read them, acknowledge them and understand them. So in terms of uh, policy development, what I've noticed is the fact that most people who are working from home haven't signed what is called the remote access policy. So if you're working from home, your organization is supposed to issue you out with the policy for remote access alongside your um, AUPs, alongside your, alongside your AUPs, alongside your um, accessible use policy, alongside your information security policy, alongside your, uh, your remote policies as well. So this is what Employee Connect is about. What I've also noticed is when you give someone a policy to read and understand and acknowledge, we just quickly glance through it like it's terms and conditions. Nobody reads policies. So what I have done with Employee Connect is we, we've got two interfaces, which is the user and the uh, backend interface, which allows us to systematically and autonomously um, check on what you're reading space, do you understand? What we have done is we've also enabled quizzes. So at the end of each policy uh, that you read, you actually acknowledge it by answering the quizzes. So when you see that you do understand what the accessible use policy is, then you move on to the next policy. So basically my, uh, my understanding of this and my aim was to target all IT companies because that's where breaches and, uh, and infrastructure um, attack come from. So once they attack your network, you are gone. And I am also um, a certified ethical hacker as well. So I do understand how this penetration occur. It all comes from network and infrastructure. So the first site for us to actually guard against such it's by us managing the human error, which is each and every employee. And um, apart from that, I'm so I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen and speak to you. Okay. So um, last week, what happened inside in South Africa in regards to the Experian data breach? It was very shocking and it was expected to say the least. I mean, South Africa has been experiencing these data leaks and, uh, and attacks. The biggest ones that we've had in the country was of course the master deed leak, which exposed over 20 million uh, people's information. So basically if you have a house or if you have registered a property, your information is actually sitting out there in a one terabyte file somewhere in the dark web. So it's very crucial and prevalent for people to take care of themselves. Digital penetration and digital hygiene is prevalent within the space that we live in. And again, another thing that I would want us, as especially women, this is Women's Month, we are dealing with a whole lot of things. We're dealing with cyberbullying, we're dealing with hacking, we're dealing with revenge porn. We do have remedies available to assist in such situations. Um, for instance, so basically this is, is, um, is targeted at all the ladies that have innovation, that have websites, that have um, development companies. If and when you feel like someone is taking over your intellectual property, we are here to assist you. Because now you develop your website, you scope it, you own the code. Then another person goes and actually develop the same thing then what do you do? Which remedies are available for you to assist you within the tech space? We also have what we call the alternative dispute resolution process, which assists in uh, your website hijacking, in your app hijacking. If somebody steals your domain name, for instance, we've got multiplefoundation.co.za. Now, a very clever person will go out there and register the same domain name. Then it becomes 
an issue with intellectual property infringement, then how do you get assisted? There are remedies out there available to help you. We have cases whereby we've, uh, we've had a guy register Spotify, register Mixit, register Mr. Price, register APSA. So each and every big company that suffers intellectual property management, they come to us for assistance. And again, I would also like to encourage each and every young lady out there watching that take it from me. Today, um, I've started my own cybersecurity firm. It's called Cybersec Clinic. And we hire more than 10 developers and interns and uh, business intelligence um, developers, you know, UI designs. So we train you from ground up. We train you from ethical hacking to penetration testing. We train you to become a policy development expert, you know. Apart from developing pe uh, policies, what's more important is adoption and enforcement of policy. How do you then make sure that we are compatible and we are actually compliant to all the policies? And um, trust me, it hasn't been very easy. I, I actually started my career as a, as a call center agent. That was like many, many years ago. And by then I was still at school. I was studying digital forensics. Then I had a job as a call center agent. And I had to build from that. Nothing comes easy, especially in a male dominated world like tech. So I then studied from policing. I went to digital forensics. I went to forensic law in IT. And here I am today. Um, one of the biggest highlights for my career was when I led um, the South African delegation alongside Minister Gekana. We were at Germany last year making presentations to, to, to on a global stage. We we're actually talking to everybody globally on a global stage, talking about how South Africa is leading digital penetration. Trust me, in Africa, South Africa is leading. We have over one, 1 1.5 million of domain names which have been registered on the .za namespace. And our penetration and our usage, it's actually very high. So the only thing that we need, and I'm so glad that we've got ladies like Udombi Kaini, so Katleho, and of course, Ulukuzana, uh, Ushamei, is the fact that we are trying our level best to bridge the digital divide, get everyone connected, just in case, for the mere fact that you've got internet, you've got fiber, it means that you are able to bridge the divide. And again, I would like to urge more women to come into the space because digital divide cannot be broken if there are people who do not have digital literacy. How do you define that story? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I've noted that you've got a lot to share. <laughs> it's like previous speakers, all of you have a lot to share. Um, but as you know, we are um, time bound with this. So thank you very much for that informative presentation, um, Doreen. I must say, phew, you've got a wealth of knowledge and, and you know, we, we all very keen to say, no, I want a website. I know this happens a lot with young women. I want a website, I'm going to retail, I'm going to marketing, but I need a website. And, and this afternoon you're in the presence of someone that, that owns .za. <laughs> You know, um, and, and she can guide you in that. And she's saying that she's available to help you with that. So I encourage all of you this afternoon to to say hello to Doreen outside of this space um, or to any members of her team, because they'll definitely be able to guide you. And then Doreen, there was just a question that came through from one of the um, what I'm going to say, one of our guests this afternoon. Um, and that was, how do I venture into optic fiber cable space? And that was a question directed to Charmaine and Doreen. Doreen, if you could answer that now, and then Charmaine, if you could respond to that question a bit later in our Q&A section. Thank you. Um, so basically, there is a, a government department called Department of Telecommunications and Digital Technologies, led by Minister Stelanda Deni. Um, you know, with that department, we've got state-owned entities that report under it, and one of them is uh, broadband in 
in Sako. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. They're actually leading in terms of fiber networking in South Africa. And I do know for a fact that they might have um, learnerships and they might have internships. And of course, um, they might take people in who want to venture into the space. And apart from them, because, well, we do work for government and we do represent the civil society and academia, I can actually mentor our young people to actually branch into into this industry you know because we know that it's very very male dominated and i would also like to see a lady digging up the ground and putting fiber optic cables and giving us connection you know i believe our role shouldn't be standardized to sitting in the office drafting policies and doing penetration testing and hacking people we can actually do the physical work too yeah. thank you very much doreen for that and thank you very much for encouraging our women in the audience this afternoon to get their hands dirty um, and to get involved in the actual underground work that is yeah. often collected by our particular gender. That is yeah. correct. Um, now I'd like to, to, to just bring us yeah. back <laughs> um, to the five-step innovation value process model this afternoon. And, and our next speaker, Tandeka Nsanga, who is the co-founder of Mkatuto, Edu Propeller NPO will go into a lot more detail in terms of when we say we're bringing an idea towards fruition where it positively transforms a business or society, of course, then requires collaboration, investments. It also requires the public to be ready, but also it requires, you know, some form of innovation. And, and Tandeka and her group have done amazing work in this space. Now, for those of you who do not know our next speaker, Tandeka is a young female scientist, originally from Mpumalanga. So if you're from Mpumalanga this afternoon, here's your sister. Um, besides co-founding Nkatuto Edu Propeller, she's also the founder of Science Gap Productions. She's currently holding a master's in science degree in physics, which she obtained cum laude from the University of KZN. She was previously employed by the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research as a master's candidate researcher and is currently a physics lecturer at the Academy of Sound Engineering. At present, she is studying towards her postgrad diploma in business administration at the Wits Business School. She has co-authored five optical journal papers, one published in the Nature Communication Journal. She has presented her research findings in several local and international conferences where in most instances, she received the best presentation award. So Tandeka, take us away with your presentation skills, ma'am. Over to you. Oh, wow. Uh, thank you so much, Nicoline. I hope I'm audible to everyone. And you are uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, firstly, I would like to express uh, my sincere appreciation to the Mutipa Foundation for extending the invite uh, to Ngatsuto H. Propeller to join this phenomenal panel of women. And um, I see you have my sort of outdated profile <laughs> because I did complete my postgraduate in business administration and I'm currently actually completing my second master's in with the Vets Business School, the Master of Management in Innovation Studies. So I'm currently quite embedded within the studies of uh, innovation. And um, I mean, what I've, what I've, as I've been sitting here and listening to the fellow speakers and um, you know, getting a lot of inspiration from you know, the, the different female uh, leaders in the space, and particularly uh, Kyra actually emphasizes why an organization like Ngatsuto Edu Propeller exists because um, we believe that we are essentially developing a pipeline of innovators because we engage uh, with learners at basic education at, uh, level and we are developing them to become entrepreneurs that have technical knowledge and that have technologies to introduce new products and services in order to drive uh, innovation for economic development. And I mean, what COVID-19 has done, has really emphasized and has shown us that the business world is very volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's very ambiguous. So we need disruptors, we need these kind of entrepreneurs that are going to come with solutions that will address, you know, virus uh, socioeconomic challenges such that, you know, we can progress and uh, develop our economy. And at Singatuto, we 
develop this pipeline of innovators through um, our eight tier process. And we basically take the learners through the innovation uh, value chain. And we start, them, we start them off by just, you know, engaging them, getting them excited about science and innovation. And while they are still excited, we then teach them STEM research principle through uh, workshops. So we basically conduct the workshop and we teach them the, research, the STEM research methodology. And at the end of the workshop, we give them a challenge and we say, go back to your community, identify a problem you want to solve and use the STEM-based uh, research principles to come up with a solution. So create STEM-based solution, invent. You know, it can be a problem that you identify within the agriculture space. You know, we don't limit them in, in, in a sense that in each uh, particular categories that they can focus on. And and um, because we are in the township and rural area uh, demographics, uh, there are certain resources that the learners don't have. And uh, as an organization, we then took it upon ourselves to ensure that we provide certain resources, such as making sure that we, we bring to them a mobile research facility such that they could use Google, for example, to try and get uh, information in order to create their solutions. I mean, if I can quote Kyra, she did say that when she came up with when she came up with her invention of the polymer, she had to do a lot of research. And unfortunately, uh, the inequality in, in, in South Africa has led or, you know, in terms of uh, infrastructure distribution, there are a lot of places, especially in the demographics that we are in, where the learners don't even have access to a mobile cell phone. So then that means as an organization, we have to make sure that we provide that kind of infrastructure for these learners to be able to be Come innovators at the end of the day. And because also the lack of role modeling uh, that has been alluded to in the panel, we also have a huge database of young professionals within the STEM field that we tap into and we use this database to ensure that we have role models for the young people, for the learners at basic education level. So we use them as mentors. So they guide the learners in the process of developing their solutions. They mentor the learners to ensure that they develop uh, quality products. And through our filtering process, uh, in the form of a final innovation in the form of an innovation expo the learners then get an opportunity to present their proposed solutions to the problems that they've identified and in the process we then select the best inventions in form of science projects but at the same time we select projects that have potential to be commercialized and um, while we are doing that we make sure that we also uh, make sure we try to bridge the digital gap by giving the learners prizes in form of laptops and cell phones, but we can't just give them the laptops. We sort of need to train them on how to use the laptop. So we then also would have a computer skills training workshop to ensure that the learners are equipped with the right side with the right type of skill set that they would need, for example, if they decide to become entrepreneurs, because you need to be able to write a proposal. But if you can't use basic Word, Microsoft Word, then you wouldn't be able to do that. And then post the computer training, we then have a technopreneurship bootcamp. So at that bootcamp, we essentially borrow tools like um, design thinking and business canvas model and train the learners or let them design business cases for their inventions. So we say, yes, it's important to create inventions through the scientific uh, methods, but it also it's important for you to be able to convert or translate that invention into a product that can essentially infiltrate the market. Because how we got to this with my partner, Tunile Kanyele, who I co-founded the organization with us that we met at CSR as master's students and our biggest frustration was that within the STEM uh, research um, field we do a lot of research and we go to a lot of international conferences where we essentially reach a limited audience in terms of people that are within the same space and the research findings don't necessarily get translated into you know back making an impact in the economy or even in the social challenges that are within communities and then we're like how can we change the system how can we perhaps help the system to ensure that the future scientists do not only invent but they invent with the purpose of making an impact and essentially that's how we ended up developing our eight year process which uh, we've been running since uh, the year 2017 and i mean just a glimpse of some of our achievements that we've had so far um, we don't necessarily focus on girl uh, learners but we just focus on learners in general but we've seen that there's a lot of participation actually that is coming from the female uh, learners we're not sure whether it's because as we interact with them you know they see us as female scientists and engineers interacting with them and perhaps they also fall in they fall in love with the fields themselves and you know want to get into um, the career
their or the, the science careers because we've seen a lot of girls participating and um, just 2019 alone currently we have a national footprint in seven provinces excluding Western Cape and the Northern Cape and um, in 2019 alone we had already partnered with 23 schools and more than 2,852 learners were taught the science research uh, methodology skills and 50, more than 50 percent of those learners were girls and um, also we've over the years um, have improved and gotten more young prof professionals to be part of um, the system because what we are doing essentially is to create an ecosystem that enables young people to be able uh, to innovate and you know to have access to certain capabilities because it's important uh, to understand that innovation um, is a process essentially of problem solving uh, through the combination of ideas, capabilities, and resources in order to create value. So we need to make sure that we have an ecosystem that enables us to do that. And that's why we then feel that it's important for us to be able to, as at an early age, to cultivate the, the, the mindset of the young people, to be able to think in an innovative manner, to be more entrepreneurial, because most of the time, I mean, our African culture, we're not, we, don't, we don't have a lot of entrepreneurs as um, examples. We don't have businesses at home. So there isn't that culture of being entrepreneurial. We're always waiting to look for jobs. I mean, some people, if you, if you go home and you're like, I'm starting a business, like, ah, why aren't you not looking for a job? So we sort of need to change the culture and the mindset such that we could have more people that are thinking of creating uh, businesses and creating employment instead of looking for employment. And for, 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 for a country like South Africa, this means that we have to start at a young age, hence we tap into the basic education level such that we are able to model and, and create that kind of mindset. And um, I mean, looking at our eight tier process, we, and comparing it to the whole process of innovation, which is managed through the innovation final starting from the idea stage where you know we come up with the ideas whether by identifying problems like in our case where we encourage the learners to go back to the community identify problems they want to solve so there are different um, stages within the final and in the very same final there are also uh, different challenges that one comes across for example while you're in the process of um, developing your technology you might find that there's a lot of uncertainty around the technology itself and also the financial requirements that are uh, required within the final also vary depending on the developmental stage and also in terms of the financial resources that are available, you find that you're a startup and you have sort of come up with an innovation, perhaps that's a software, and you want to sell it to some hardware company to embed in it. They would ask for a proof of concept, which means you have to sort of give them your technology before they actually buy it. So for you, that that, that is a cost. And as a startup, most of the time, uh, there isn't really much access to funds because most of um, technology-based solutions, they, they, they have a lot of risks. So you don't find uh, investors that are, you know, uh, risk prone. Most people are like, you know, they shy away from investing during, you know, certain stages of, uh, of development. So there are a lot of challenges in between the development uh, stages. So in our case, we ensure that we, you know, we make sure that the learners at least from as young as they are, they understand that even though I'm doing a science stream, because that's another thing, our, our basic education system is structured in the sense that if you're doing a, the science stream, there's no accounting, there's no business economics, so you're just doing science. And that filters also when you go to university. If you're taking a science degree, it's a science degree. There's nothing that you know, will, will, will teach you about the accounting, the finances. So what we are doing, we are saying from that uh, element, we are making sure that we are combining because you cannot innovation is about creating value so you can have your invention but if it's not creating value at the end then it's it's not innovation because innovation is about being able to convert that uh, invention into something that you know has an impact whether through uh, generating of a profit or making a direct impact um you know for, for for the society so essentially it's important that and um i mean also having heard from the previous speakers um in terms of supporting um, the development of um, innovation within the final, it's important to have certain resources such as finances, but not only that, social capital is quite important because you might find that you are ready to go to market. And perhaps if, you, if, 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 if there are platforms that enable uh, certain networks for you to tap into, then you'd be able to perhaps have a go to market uh, 
strategic partner that will enable you to to be able to access uh, what you call customers and you know be able to diffuse your technology because that's another thing not um, the diffusion process of technology is sometimes a challenge which also requires so now beyond the actual small bits of innovations or technology firms that are being developed they require a functional national system of innovation where you've got your government you've got the, your your private sector as well as your civil organizations like Ngatsu to Asia Propeller that sort of can create a conducive environment that will inspire and 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 make sure that uh, innovation is not stifled because of lack of resources or because of a lack of infrastructure in terms of i mean in south africa the basic infrastructure such as electricity is the biggest problem so if you are getting into this tech space and trying to you know be a, build a company within that space you already need to worry about uh, load shading for example so if we can have a national system of innovation that is connected that enables and um, you know enables innovation to flourish then i think um, it would help in, in, in making sure that the very same pipeline that we are developing can be then channeled into that national system of innovation and we can create more tech-based companies because if you want to catch up to the industrialized world as a as a country unfortunately we have to we have to really really look into the development of local local based uh, technological firms which are really most of the time it's better to it's it's better to actually address some of the local challenges because you can then expand into other African countries that have similar challenges as uh, your your country. So there are, there are opportunities there that are being presented by the fourth industrial revolution for us to tap into as a country, but it, it, it is important that we need to have that uh, functional national system of innovation that will allow us to create an ecosystem that is conducive for these kind of uh, Schumpeterian entrepreneurs to thrive and create uh, economic growth. And, um, Essentially, um, in closing, I would like to quote uh, uh, Mr. Bill Gates, uh, who gave advice to the entrepreneurs, and he said, the more you can learn the science, the more you will see where the opportunity is, because the answers to energy and health problems will come from scientific research, so that it becomes important to also prepare the capabilities that will be able to absorb that kind of uh, scientific rule to translate it into um, you know commercializable product <coughs> sorry and services so that's why we are saying we need more kind of um, you know functional ecosystem that will enable innovation to thrive thank you uh, Nicole thank you very much Tandeka for that um, enlightening presentation and why I say it's enlightening is because we speak of the process model but we don't understand the nuts and bolts of, of that model and you've really broken it down into something that is tangible, something that we can make meaning of. And, and in your presentation, you made reference to, to us coming up with innovations that not only speak to South African problems, but the continent's problems and global problems. Is it possible for you to share with us some examples or, or, or ideas or organizations that you know have done this so that it becomes more tangible for our listeners this afternoon? Um, I mean, as an organization, we work quite closely with um, another organization in Zimbabwe, which is also founded by a woman, which is quite uh, fascinating. So our programs are similar in that uh, we target um, young people to sort of, you know, think innovatively and focus on, um, you know, generating solutions for problems that they identify in their opportunity, in, in their communities. And I think um, that space also, in terms of funding, because you'd find that there's only one uh, organization that will sort of um, promote th those kind of collaborative measures between organizations that are placed within Africa, but not necessarily from one country. So it's you'd only find that perhaps it's just the innovation fund that uh, gives you that kind of support in being able to work with you know other. Um, organizations um, across you know the border so you know there are some challenges uh, within that but I think also we've seen uh, some technolo technologies like Mbesa which you know 
cuts across borders. And I mean, there's a lot of um, individuals within Africa that are unbanked. So they're not in the banking system and systems like Mbesa are sort of those solutions that are local solutions that sort of addresses local challenges. And imagine if we create more of those kind of solutions, whether it be it's in agriculture. I mean, Africa is mm -hmm. really one of those countries where we are, you know, resource intensive. If we create solutions that, you know, improve our mining capability, then that kind of solution would easily spread across the continent. If create solutions that are more centered around agriculture, those kind of technologies can easily spread, you know, across the continent. So that's why we also, I mean, as an organization, we have a few programs that we are running. And one of the one that one program that we are currently also working on is developing a um, hydroponic system. So we realized young people are not into farming. So to try and make it uh, relevant or for them to relate to it, we thought hydroponics, uh, hydroponic system are great because they combine technology. So, I mean, you can automate your hydroponic system such that it can put on nutrients on the vegetables whenever they are needed. So we are currently formulating um, a, a, a module and also like a, an experimental kind of setup in our different partner schools to teach the learners the basics of farming and uh, introduction to hydroponic system because food is quite important. And I mean, in Africa, again, there's a lot of countries that are suffering from poverty and you know malnutrition. So it's important for, we feel it's important for young people to appreciate the value chain of uh, food production from the level from as, as, as from the level of planting, be it traditional farming, or in our case, we are more focusing on hydroponics because at least there's the technology that gets them excited, and you know they can create all the fancy robots to do certain things and sense whether the level of water is now needs to be added or whatever the case is. Thank you very much, Tandeka. I see Dr. Uh, Motsepe is back on screen. That means that my time has actually come to an end. <laughs> but before I hand over, I am going to ask all of you to please just um, wrap up and, and give us your closing remarks. And my re first request to Shamaine, because I know Shamaine presented at the beginning and then we went through all of you, there were a lot of questions that came through in the chat box for Shamaine. So Shamaine, in your closing, I'm hoping you can also share with us and, and You've got a wealth of knowledge and experience having worked um, across the continent. And so from your perspective and your lens, what is the value proposition of, of innovations? Okay, my phone seems to be jumping up and down. <laughs> um, what is the value proposition of, of innovations when compared to those abroad? So when we look at our local innovations, when we look at what we produce in Africa, what's the value prop versus that in which you see in the global north? And then how would you challenge the myth? And then I posed this question earlier on that African women inventors are of a lower standard to those in the global north. And, and then I, I, don't, I, I, I don't actually think that there is a debate. I just think a big challenge that I pick up, Nicole, I work a lot in Silicon Valley as well because my company is based, my boss sits in Silicon Valley. Um, so I do regular um, trips there to, to, to also just keep up to date with what's happening. I think a big difference I see um, is the fact that what we as Africans like to do, we like to take solutions from Silicon Valley um, and I think Kiara touched on it earlier. Kiara was saying that um, Silicon Valley has a very clever business model. They go to the Yales, they go to the Harvards, they go to all the Ivy League schools, my company included, and we take those interns and they spend quite a significant amount of time in the organization innovating and, and you know, changing and coming up with, with um, significant technologies. And again, they're solving challenges for Silicon Valley. Um, and I think what we want to do is we want to copy and paste that and bring it into Africa, where our challenges are remarkably different. Um, so I often find that where we're missing valuable opportunities on the continent is to solve for challenges in our communities. So solve for wearables. We know that GBZ is um, a crisis in the country. It's, it's a pandemic. Um, and what we can be doing is solving wearables that for young girls who walk along to school or coming back from work, they can have a wearable on the arm that if somebody comes within a close distance, artificial intelligence um, is able to already. You have in Silicon Valley robots in the malls. You have robots everywhere. And if they pick up that you're sweating profusely, 
obviously your heart is beating at a certain rate, it actually sends an alarm to the control center to say either this person is coming to rob or they're going to do something that's unusual because their body temperature is all over the place. Um, it's just not normal for, for the behavior they're exhibiting. Now, something like that can be applied to human beings. We're already currently tracking rhinos. My company is involved with a number of organizations where we track rhinos. We have similar internet of things or sensors on the rhino if you're trying to poach. So why not take that as a solution to bring it back in? And again, if you think of it, um, why I say there shouldn't be a debate around who's better than who, if you look at Mpesa, Mpesa is a technology that was designed in the East of Africa, and it's one of the most phenomenal um, cashless societies that to this day leads globally. And even if you look at a simple innovation like Please Call Me, also very remarkable that we're solving our challenges because we're the only people who need data. And in closing, I want to say thank you to um, Dr. Precious. You know, something that, that actually threw me off for this conversation was at least one the team calling me to ask me if I need data. Because again, <laughs> we're understanding and realizing, and it's phenomenal, right? That is, it's like, I, I was so touched because often when we're doing hackathons and we're doing stuff for a lot of the youngsters, they often have to say, sorry, we have to drop off. I've run out of data. And I was just so touched that the thought process is so broad that if we're involving you, to ensure that you have the two to participate. So again, please call me you, please call us and our family members we have to connect. Thank you, Charmaine. And that is something that we often take for granted. Thank you very much to the team for that extension. Um, you all have 30 seconds closing remarks before I hand over to Dr. Butsepe. I'll start with Tandeka, 30 seconds. All right, thank very you very much. Um, I think uh, the fourth industrial revolution is giving us an opportunity to collaborate. I mean, look at us right now, pandemic or not, we are having this webinar and we are discussing essential issues. So I think it is important for us to tap into our resources, join forces and create this ecosystem that will cultivate innovation and drive economic growth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tandeka. Doreen, over to you, your elevator pitch. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, as a woman, don't be afraid to brag of your innovations. Don't be afraid to take scene and actually break the glass ceiling and tag. And one more thing, remember your digital footprint, the internet never forgets. So whenever you go online and you pretend to be something that you're not, remember, net neutrality doesn't exist in South Africa. So you need Thank to you very much, Doreen. Um, we're gonna go with Ntombi Kaisi. And closing remarks, let's be innovators. Let's compete with the global market. Let's bring African solutions outside. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kiara, welcome back. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, my elevator pitch would be, um, let's continue creating spaces like this where people can, young people can see other role models in the industry and, and look up to their work and what they've been doing to apply it to, to kind of their ideas and their innovations. Thank you very much, Kiara. Katlejo? Um, I would just say, go for what you want. If you, if you think of an idea, go for it. There are challenges, there are different things that you can look at, but just go for what you want, create what you want to create. Let's innovate. Thank you very much. At this point, I would like to thank the Mutsepe Foundation and I would like to thank Dr. Precious Munoy Mutsepe for creating this opportunity for all of us here this afternoon. Um, I'm not gonna labor the thanks. I'm gonna hand over to you, Dr. Precious Munoy Mutsepe. Wow, Nicole, you've been an absolutely amazing facilitator. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I've really enjoyed it looks like you know the session should not be ending. Uh, let me thank every one of our panel members. Nicole, again, uh, Doreen, thank you so much. Kiara, thanks, I'm so happy you could stay with us this long. I believed you had another engagement. And Dombigayise, um, thank you so much. I think I must have left somebody. Uh, Doreen, did I mention you? And Katleho, um, Thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope I didn't leave anybody out. Okay, I think from my side, I think we, we have touched on so many subjects. 
you know, ideas from agriculture right through to robots to cybersecurity. This has been a really incredible session and I'm super excited because we always talk about inspiring the next generation um, and it looks like there is a gap when it comes to the the actual practitioners so this platform was created for us to see the practitioners so that the young girls that we support at schools and in universities can actually see the work that you're doing so thank you very much for sharing with us your ideas how you overcome them and you know i mean I am so hopeful for the future of uh, women in STEM. Um, I just want to say that at the foundation, um, I'm a doctor by training. I, I did not get into engineering adverts, which I, which I had wanted to, but um, you know, the scholarship was not uh, supporting uh, uh, um, medicine, which I wanted to do. And I you know, uh, was to push to engineering. So it's good to see young women that are in engineering in tech and doing amazing things. So what we have created at the foundation from the um, a, a, a basic education is to build laboratories for students so they can have environments to learn um, at uh, high school and primary schools. At universities, and this is universities throughout South Africa, we support students, particularly girls who want to study in the STEM fields. Um, more than that, we also have programs that we partner with globally. And this is what I think is very interesting for people at your levels for, from our side. We've got partnerships with uh, Harvard. Uh, we've got a Harvard Accelerator Program that looks at projects that solve, so that give solutions to African problems. So this is not about Harvard looking at solutions in America, but we're looking at solutions in Africa and I need, we need innovators from the continent to solve those problems. We've got another prize, um, the Milken Mutipe Foundation Prize, uh, also a, a partnership with the Milken Institute, which is based in LA. It's also looking at innovations um, that are focused on Africa and my number one desire is to have Africans solving those problems that face uh, Africa. And lastly, um, I had all of you talking about how you're trying to tackle some, you know, problems on the continent, particularly uh, targeting our poor and marginalized communities. This is about social entrepreneurship and it's a program that the foundation supports very much. Uh, actually, it is a secret, but one of um, our, in our network, uh, you know, of, of women in STEM, we have somebody that's gonna be winning a prize at the World Economic Forum uh, for the work that they are doing on the continent. And what that means is that, you know, you get um, exposure to people like Bill Gates, you know, um, to Klaus Schwab, to all these great people that can help you to get your work um, out there in the world. So again, let me say thank you so much to all of you for sharing so willingly and so uh, excitedly about the work that you're doing. And for our students that are watching, um, I was gonna say the sky is the limit, but no, the sky is not the limit. <laughs> for all of you woman vators, that's what I, the term I heard from, from my foundation is not innovators, but you are woman vators. Enjoy your weekend, enjoy the rest of Women's Month, and thank you again for joining us this, this afternoon. <laughs> thank you and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank, thank you. you. Bye. But as a woman, you must also know what you want. You must be headstrong and stand your ground and not be easily pushed around. Balancing motherhood and my studies was super difficult because he, he was around. I knew that I had to fight till the end. You can achieve anything you put your mind to. Usually people say reach for the sky or the sky is the limit. Actually, no, the sky is not the limit.